Welcome everyone to this public lecture. So for those that don't know me yet, my name is Chris Trivandi and I am a professor in statistics uh, in the School of Mathematical Sciences here at QUT, which stands for the Queensland University of Technology. And I'm also the director of the ANSI Winter School for this year. So welcome everyone to this public lecture and this public lecture has been co-organized by ANSI and also SSA, which is the Statistical Society of Australia. So this year, this event is being presented as part of the ANSI Winter School. And the ANSI Winter School aims to introduce students to cutting edge research and methodologies in statistical data science and gives postgraduate students a rare opportunity to work and network with their peers from around Australia. This lecture is designed to give both students and the general public the opportunity to learn more about the broader applications of the mathematical sciences and how it impacts everyday life. So now just join me in a welcome to country. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I am on today, which for QUT is the Turrbal and Yugara people, as well as the traditional owners of the land you are situated on and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and waterways of Australia for thousands of years. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So just before we start the lecture, I just wanted to remind everybody that this event is being recorded and it will be posted to the AMZ YouTube channel. So now I just want to pass it over to uh, Professor Troy Farrell, who is the uh, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science at QUT, and Troy will introduce our speaker. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, and good evening, everybody. And please let me uh, begin by saying what a pleasure it is for QUT as this year's host of the MC Winter School um, on statistical data science to jointly host this public uh, lecture in conjunction with AMC and the Statistical Society of Australia. And to this end, I would really like to acknowledge and thank uh, Professor Chris Travandi and Andre McFarlane from QUT, uh, Anna Mascara and the team at AMC and Associate Professor David Fraser from SSA for their parts in bringing this fantastic uh, event together. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Renata Meyer. Professor Meyer is Professor of Statistics at the University of Auckland, and she obtained an MSc and PhD in Mathematics and Statistics from the University of Aachen in Germany before moving to Auckland in 1994 to take up uh, an academic position. Professor Meyer works in Applied Bayesian Inference and Markov Chain Monte Carlo Methods and leads interdisciplinary research collaborations in such diverse areas as astrophysics, economics, fisheries, marine ecology, medicine and engineering. She has made significant contributions to these fields, including in astrophysics, where she has done foundational and pioneering work on statistical approaches to gravitational wave and cosmic microwave background radiation data analysis, and the estimation of parameters for binary black hole mergers, the topic of her talk tonight. Professor Meyer has had several distinguished career highlights to date, and her work has been widely recognised, including in 2018 when she received a prestigious James Cook Research Fellowship from the Royal Society of New Zealand for research on noise characterisation studies of, later, of laser interferometric gravitational wave observatories. Recently, she also received the Little John Research Award of, uh, from the New Zealand Statistical Society, and that was in 2020. Professor Meyer is widely published and highly cited in the top journals in her field, and she's given numerous uh, invited presentations and has held visiting positions in, at institutions in Germany and in France. Well, tonight, we're very lucky to have her here to speak with us. And the title of her talk is Data Detectives on the Trail of Black Hole Mergers. Please join me in welcoming Professor Renata Meyer. Oh, thank you very much, Troy, for the very kind introduction. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. And I'd uh, 
I like to say also Tenakauto, Tenakauto, Tenakauto Katoa for anybody who is zooming in from New Zealand. It's a great pleasure to be giving this public lecture here tonight, and I'm very excited that I can be part of that MZ Winter School that way. And uh, I'd like to thank thank you all for having me and for organizing this uh, fantastic event. So without any further ado, I'd like to share my screen. And I'll just maximize my slides. And if you could give me a thumbs up if it uh, is all visible. Yep. Great. Then we can get uh, cracking. And uh, what I'd like to focus tonight on is uh, black hole mergers and how we can make use of statistics uh, to make sense of the observed signal. And I'd like to start with a famous quote. Uh, the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. What I'd like to do tonight is take you all for play in the backyard of the astrophysicist. Because I think we're all excited uh, about the universe and fascinated. Uh, for thousands of years, we've looked at the night sky with our naked eyes. And since, whoops, since uh, Galileo, with telescopes, and we've developed increasingly powerful telescopes. So we can see, observe, observe events in the universe in gamma ray and X-ray and ultraviolet and visible infrared, microwave or radio waves. It's a bit like going for a bushwalk though, like here in the Lemming National Park. Uh, see all the beautiful trees, the lush undergrowth, a subtropical rainforest. And I'll just do a little bit of a fast forward. Not that fast. Uh, if you've brought binoculars like these guys here, you'll be able to maybe spot some interesting birds, like this eastern whip bird, and see what it looks like up close. But isn't there something missing, something that might have alerted you to the spot where you first saw the wood bird in the very first place, because we usually hear the birds first before uh, we spot them. Of course, what's missing is the sound. Now you can you make use of another sense and you know what the call of the wood bird sounds like now. So could there be thunder when two black holes collide? Could we listen to the universe? That would be great because 99% of the universe is dark and will never be observable in any type of electromagnetic light. But of course, sound waves need air to propagate. There's no sound in a vacuum. What does propagate through the universe though are gravitational waves according to Einstein's prediction from 100 years ago. And since 2015, we can actually listen to the universe. That's when the two LIGO detectors directly measured gravitational waves for the very first time. And the signal lasted only for a fraction of a second and came from the end spiral of two stellar mass black holes that coalesced to form a single rotating black hole and signal waveform shown here, matching the predictions of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And this is the sound of two black holes colliding. The physicists call this a chirp signal, but it just sounds a lot like a whip to me. Now, with gravitational waves, LIGO has opened really a new window to the universe, which, which we can observe events that would be hidden to electromagnetic telescopes. And we we can see further into the universe because gravitational waves are not obstructed by any matter. What I'd like to do in this lecture is give you a bit of an historical uh, overview of the events that led to, the, to this spectacular discovery for which the founders of LIGO, Barry Barish, Kip Thorne and Rainer Weiss were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017. And then I'll talk a bit about uh, how statistics could make sense of the observed signal and 
uh, I'll finish with some out outlook to uh, space-based interferometer. So in 1915, Einstein published a paper in which uh, he laid down the foundations for the theory of general relativity. And a year later, in 1916, in a paper, he uh, gave an approximate solution to the field equation of general relativity. And I can read that paper. It's written in my native German language, but I'm not an astrophysicist. So the intricacies of general relativity are way beyond me. But my physics colleagues assure me that this has multiple applications. In particular, this paper predicts the existence of gravitational waves. And in this paper, Albert Einstein gives an equation for the amplitude of the gravitational waves. And he concedes that for all practical purposes of measuring gravitational waves, the amplitude was far too tiny. So what are gravitational waves? So in gravity in general relativity is not a force, but it is a deformation of the four dimensional manifold of space time. Massive objects such as the sun here and the earth have gravity and they'll deform space time. The more massive the object, the more space time will curve. And gravitational waves are accelerate or ripples in the space time caused by accelerated massive objects. And John Wheeler once very succinctly said, matter tells space time how to curve, and space time tells matter how to move. Gravitational waves um, uh, squeeze and stretch any matter that they pass through in a very characteristic way that gives us information about the emitting source. Their effect is orthogonal to the direction of propagation, and uh, they come in a plus and a cross polarization. So a passing gravitational wave will stretch the distance between two test masses on the horizontal axis, squeezing the distance on the vertical axis. And it is exactly this uh, relative the change in the relative spacings between two test masses, so-called strain that's measured by LIGO. But space-time is quite rigid and these gravitational waves are small. So once they reach Earth, the strain will be in the order of 10 to the power minus 21. So a thousand times smaller than the diameter of a proton, which explains why it's been so difficult to measure gravitational waves. And after Einstein published his paper in 1916, it was a hotly debate, debated topic whether gravitational waves were actually real and could transport energy from one place of the universe to another, or whether they were just an artifact of the theory. And even Einstein started to doubt it and tried to publish a paper in the 1930s that refuted the existence of gravitational waves. So it's not really surprising that not even an attempt was made to design an experiment that could measure gravitational waves, but that all changed 1957 with the Chapel Hill Conference, when Felix Pirani, a theoretical astrophysicist, presented a paper in which he attributed the relative acceleration of particle pairs with a Riemann tensor. And Richard Feynman was present, and uh, he took up that argument, but instead of corroborating it with, more, with a more theoretical argument, he gave a very hands-on argument, which became famous as the sticky beat argument. And that basically goes like that. If you put two beats on a rod that could move freely, a passing gravitational wave would cause those beats to move up and down, and that would cause uh, the rods and the, the beats to heat up because of friction, which infers that gravitational waves actually do transport energy. And that convinced the astrophysicists and even inspired Joe Weber to design the first gravitational wave detector way back in 1958. And Joe Weber later claimed to have detected gravitational waves, but there was just shown to be an instrumental error. So that was in the 1950s, and the first indirect proof of the existence of gravitational waves came in 1974, when uh, Russell Hulse and Joseph Taylor started to use radio telescopes to observe the orbital period of a binary pulsar. And over many years, they uh, proved that the Energy, energy loss uh, associated with this orbital decay rate was consistent with the emission of gravitational waves. And for that indirect proof of the existence of gravitational waves, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1993. Paper came out in 1982. So how can we measure gravitational waves? Unlike tremors caused by earthquakes, tremors in space-time are not measured by seismometers, but they are measured by 
so-called Michelson interferometry, laser interferometry. And it is Rainer Weiss at MIT who was the first to uh, invent laser interferometry for the measurement of gravitational waves. That was in 1972. And Kip Thorne at Caltech became very interested, made a lot of theoretical contributions and prototypes of interferometers were built by Rainer Weiss at MIT, Heinz Billing at the Max Planck Institute in Geising in Germany, and also Ron Drever at the University of Glasgow. And Ron Drever later on joined uh, Kip Thorne at Caltech and uh, it was it is suspected that he would have been awarded the Nobel Prize uh, if um, he hadn't passed away shortly before the award. So the principle of laser interferometry is very simple. Laser light is split into two beams, which are sent down two perpendicular vacuum tubes, at the end of which are test masses suspended on a pendulum to imitate free fall. These test masses are mirror coated, so laser light is reflected and travels back. These arms, uh, these vacuum tubes have the same length, laser light travels at the speed of light, so upon recombination there will be a destructive interference pattern and no laser light will be detected at this photodetector. But if a gravitational wave passes, it will stretch one arm and squeeze the other, so laser light will travel back faster in one arm than in the other, causing a change in the light interference pattern and the light intensity and that's measured at the photodetector. That's uh, uh, after the prototypes were built, uh, Caltech and MIT joined forces and did a feasibility study of designing and building a proper interferometer. And they applied for funding uh, of the National Science Foundation in 1989 to build two detectors, one in Livingston, Louisiana, the other one in Hanford, Washington, with four kilometer long arm lengths. And there was a project on a huge scale that had never been attempted before. So the NSF did a very careful evaluation and they obtained funding in 1992. Project lingered for a little, little while until Barry Barish became the new lab director in 1994 and he made things happen. And 1997, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration was formed under the leadership of Rainer Weiss and that was tasked with all the scientific aspects of that experiment. Took another five years for LIGO to be finished and become operational with the first observing run starting uh, started in 2002. And this is what the interferometers look like with their four kilometer long arm lengths at Hanford and Livingston. There's an experimental detector which has been operating for uh, a long time in Geo 600 in Hanover, Germany with 600 meter long arm lengths, a lot less sensitive than LIGO. It's run by the Max Planck Institute, and they made huge contributions to all the elements or the, the components that went into the LIGO interferometers. And then there's another one operating Logo in Italy with three kilometer long arm lengths. Kagra, an underground detector in Japan, has just been built and will join LIGO and Virgo in the next observing runs next year. And Two further ones are in the planning, one in India and in China. And it's actually quite important to have a worldwide network of detectors. One reason is that uh, two or more detectors allow to pinpoint where the event occurred in the sky to, to uh, estimate the sky location. That's not possible with just one detector. And second, it increases the detection confidence. If you see the same signal at two detectors, you can be a lot more confident that that was actually caused by gravitational wave and not just by a truck driving, driving past. So what is LIGO listening out for? Well, in theory, any acceleration of masses that is not spherically or rotationally symmetric will emit gravitational waves. I've got this dumbbell here hopefully see, if I would spin this on its, around its axle, it will not emit gravitational waves. But if it tumbles end over end, like sort of orbiting planets, this dumbbell will emit gravitational waves. And the heavier the dumbbell and the faster I'll spin it, the stronger is the gravitational wave. But these would be far too small to be detectable. So the physicists don't have any chance of detecting or designing a lab experiment to measure gravitational waves. The only hope is from cataclysmic events in the universe. And there are various different sources that could emit gravitational waves. And one of the most promising sources are so-called compact binary coalescences. 
these are in spirals and mergers of two compact objects. And these compact objects could be either two neutron stars, a neutron star in the black hole, or two black holes. And you may uh, know that just a few weeks ago, LIGO uh, confirmed the very first detection of a neutron star in the black hole merger. So it's these two compact objects in spiral around each other. They lose energy due to the emission of gravitational waves, so the orbital distance decreases, the orbital frequency increases, and so does the uh, frequency of the emitted gravitational waves. The frequency and the amplitude increases until they merge. That gives this characteristic chirp signal. And if it's two black holes, they form a single rotating black hole, which then emits gravitational wa waves at a damped down amplitude and a more constant frequency. That's the ring down phase that we see here. And this waveform is quite well understood and modeled by the physicists. I'll say in a few minutes a bit more about the waveform models. And they depend, or the, this frequency evolution basically depends on the masses of the two stars, their distance, their spins, their inclination angles, and so on. And these are burst signals. They are very short. They have a very short duration of a fraction of a second up to a few seconds for neutron star mergers. That's not the only source, although so far, this is the uh, only source that LIGO has detected so far. Pulsars, or rapidly rotating neutron stars, will also emit gravitational waves. They are um, very compact objects, as massive as our sun, but in compressed in a, to a di diameter of about 20 kilometers. So extremely compact, and they give off electromagnetic regular pulses of electromagnetic radiation. That's why they call pulsars. And that the gravitational waves they emit are uh, at twice the rotational frequency. So instead of this chirp signal, they uh, emit these continuous sinusoidal signals. And then there are signals from the Coccolet supernovae events. Uh, so at the life of massive stars usually ends with the a collapse of the iron core under uh, its own gravity, forming neutron star or black hole, followed by a supernova explosion, usually. Uh, these co-collapse supernova events are quite rare. If they occur within five kiloparsecs of the Earth, they will be detectable by LIGO. But they are rare. It's estimated that LIGO will only detect three per century. And so far, none of these co-collapse supernova events have, has been observed. But the physicists have huge interest in observing the gravitational waves because they could get an, a, a lot of information about the physical processes at core collapse. And again, these uh, supernovae core collapse signals will be very short burst signals, but the signal waveform is not very well understood, not as well modeled as the, uh, those of the compact binaries. And then there's the stochastic gravitational wave background. So that's basically the superposition of all unresolved sources. Stochastic gravitational wave background here could have two origins, astrophysical, superposition of all the signals from the binary and spirals, the pulsars, and so on. But also the could have cosmological origin because the physical processes in the very early universe will have emitted gravitational waves. It's basically the analog to the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the electromagnetic remnant of the Big Bang. But with electromagnetic radiation, the physicists can only see as far back as 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Gravitational waves potentially up to fractions of a second after the Big Bang. That's why it's so important to detect and measure the stochastic gravitational wave background. None of these Gravitational wave sources signals were observed by LIGO from 2002 when it uh, started operating until 2010. All these years while LIGO was observing, no signal was detected. And then it was decided to upgrade LIGO to increase its sensitivity by installing better mirror suspensions, mirror coatings, um, cooling systems, and so on. That actually increased LIGO's sensitivity by about a factor of 10. And then shortly after LIGO was switched on in August 2015, they didn't have to wait long for the quarks to pop with the very first detection of a black hole merger. And you can uh, probably imagine the euphoria after waiting for so long and working so hard on, on the detection. So 
Since then, LIGO has had uh, two further observation runs, and after each observing run, uh, the systems are maintained and they usually increase in, its, in their um, uh, uh, sensitivity. And uh, so far, a total of 50 binary mergers in spirals have been confirmed by, by LIGO. The last observing run had to end shortly due to the COVID pandemic in March 2020. One event really stands out uh, out of these 50 compact binary uh, events, and that is GW170817, which on the 17th of August 2017, while LIGO and Virgo were all three operating, LIGO issued an automatic alert that of a, an event that was consistent with a neutron star merger. And in contrast to black hole mergers, neutron star mergers will give off an initial burst of gamma rays followed by a kilonova, and that is observable by electromagnetic telescopes. So 1.7 seconds after LIGO's alert, the gamma ray, Fermi gamma ray burst monitor issued a trigger. Fermi has only very low directional sensitivity. So they, Fermi could only give a very broad estimate of uh, this, the region in the sky where the event might be located. And even combining this with the international network of gamma ray burst monitors, there was still a big area. But the two LIGO detectors gave two narrow strips one of which overlapped uh, the region determined by Fermi, shown here in green. And with Virgo operating as well, that could be narrowed down further. And that allowed the electromagnetic telescopes to zoom in, find, try to find the host galaxy among 50 odd candidates in that region. And once that was found, zoom in further and observe the kilonova, which was rapidly fading. So a race was on by about 70 electromagnetic telescopes all over the world to try and observe this. So that was the very first event that was observed in both gravitational wave and electromagnetic waves and throughout the whole electromagnetic range. If there had ever been any doubt of whether LIGO had detected gravitational waves, I think this neutron star merger dispersed all the, all the, all the doubts. And it was a hugely significant event because the very fact that the gamma ray burst came 1.7 seconds after the gravitational waves basically confirms Einstein's prediction that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. The physicists could get a much better estimate of the Hubble constant, the expansion rate of the universe, one of the key parameters of our understanding of the, the evolution of the universe by combining the distance estimates from LIGO with the redshift measurements from the electromagnetic telescopes. And then, Astrophysicists have long suspected that heavy elements on Earth, such as gold and platinum, are created when neutron stars collide. And that was now confirmed because traces of heavy elements were detected, estimated that about 10 Earth masses alone in gold and platinum were created during this very collision of that neutron star merger. So this is the, these are some uh, binary and spiral signals that were observed during the first observation runs. And uh, this here is the neutron star merger. So the signal looks a bit different to the, the black hole mergers, a longer duration. After observing and detecting the signal, the question is what can we say about the nature of uh, the emitting system, about the nature of the source, the characteristics? And for that, we need statistical inference. And that brings me to statistical parameter estimation. And Rainer Weiss, the, one of the uh, founders of LIGO, recently attended a theoretical astrophysics conference and he uh, taught, was talking to Neil Cornish, uh, data scientists and, and uh, uh, physicists at uh, LIGO. And he told Neil that we don't really need your fancy statistics. We just need to build better detectors. So. Who would want to argue with a Nobel Prize recipient? But I still beg to differ. In a way, Rainer Weiss is correct. We just, for the detection, we just need simple signal processing. This is one second of real LIGO data around the first black hole merger. 
can't really see the signal yet, this chirp signal in this uh, data because it's swamped by low frequency noise. But if we do a bandpass filter and cut out the low and the high frequency components, we can see that signal with our naked eyes. And if we take out the 60 hertz power lines using notch filter, we can see it even more clearly. The question though is what, how do we know from this chirp signal that that was caused by black hole or by the merger of two black holes? You know, recently, or that was actually before the COVID pandemic, uh, Christopher Berry from Northwestern University, a LIGO scientist visited Auckland University, he said, you can convince yourself that this signal must have come from two black hole mergers just by using basic physics and a calculation on the back of an envelope. So I'm not an astrophysicist, but I think I can follow the, this, this argument and you probably can't read my handwriting. So let's go through this in a little bit more, more detail. The change of the frequency is that we observe in, in that chirp signal, it, in, it increases in frequency until it, it merges. That is governed by a differential equation, which basically um, depends on the speed of light, the gravitational life constant, but more significantly on this M, which is the so-called chirp mass, a combination of the masses of the two uh, objects. And we can get a rough estimate of the chirp mass just from that very chirp signal. We just transform this equation so that we get an equation of M in terms of the frequency and the frequency derivative. And we get rough estimates of the frequency and its frequency derivative from the chirp signal, but just by uh, looking at the, the zero crossings, we get an estimate of 30 solar masses just from the observed signal. Now we want to know how close did these two objects get shortly before merging. And shortly before merging, the amplitude of the gravitational wave signal will be at its peak. And from that chirp signal, we can read off at what frequency that uh, peak amplitude occurred, and that occurred at 150 hertz roughly. The orbital frequency is at half that gravitational wave frequency. So the orbital frequency was 75 hertz. And that orbital frequency is one of the parameters, as well as the total mass, which determines the orbital separation. The total mass, if we just for to simplify things, assume that the two objects have the same mass, the total mass is roughly 70 solar masses. And then the orbital separation is given by this formula, 350 kilometers. So 350 kilometers might seem like huge distance to you, but on the scale of stars, that is just a tiny wee distance. And that must mean that these two com objects were tiny and compact, very compact. Otherwise, if they had gotten so close to each other, they would have already merged and collided. If we compare that orbital separation to a typical size of a black hole with the same mass, which is given by the Schwarzschild radius, we get compactness of 1.7. So that means that the system was so compact, it must have been containing black holes. If you're interested, uh, there's a beautifully uh, beautiful written paper uh, written by the science, uh, LIGO, science, uh, LIGO Science Collaboration, appeared in 2017, which explains the black hole dynamics just using very basic high school physics without any um, higher order, higher any knowledge in, in general relativity. And that is published in uh, the same journal that I, I, Albert Einstein published his first paper in 1916. So we can get rough estimates but by, with these uh, considerations, but to get more accurate estimates of the parameters that characterize the system and also quantify the remaining estimation error, we need statistical models and statistical techniques for parameter estimation. And for that, we need a statistical model. We usually assume that the observed data composed of a deterministic signal that depends on certain parameters that describe that binary system, like the, the masses, the distance, the spins, and so on, and some residual instrumental noise. So that's signal plus 
residual noise. So let's look at these two components. Let's look at the signal first. Signal at LIGO is a linear combination of the cross and the plus polarization, where the antenna beam patterns are given by this formula. So they depend on the style location in terms of the right ascension, declination angle, and the polarization angle. And these plus cross polarization waveforms can be written in terms of a time varying amplitude and time varying phase. And they also depend on the inclination angle iota. And these are obtained basically by solving the two body dynamics of general relativity, usually perturbatively, perturbatively sorry, um, using post Newtonian approximations of various different orders. Those post Newtonian approximations, they hold for the in spiral phase, but closer to merger, they are no longer accurate and they need to be supplemented and calibrated by simulations from numerical relativity. So the waveforms that are used to estimate the parameters of gravitational wave, wave signals are um, composed of the in-spiral merge and ring down phases, uh, and they depend on a total of 15 parameters. Nine parameters are needed to uh, describe the circular spin, uh, the circular binary with no spin, that's the two masses, the distance to the, to the Earth, the sky location, the inclination angle, polarization angle, the time of coalescence, and the orbital phase. And we need three additional parameters for each of the compact objects to take the effect of the spin into account. So what about the residual noise? Here we've got one second of real LIGO noise sampled at 16 kilohertz. So we can't really see anything how, how that looks. But if we zoom in, we see that it's certainly not independent and identically distributed, one of the st standard statistical assumptions. But it looks at least stationary. The dependent structure does not seem to be changing over time. And stationary noise is usually no problem for any point estimate. but we want to quantify the uncertainty that depends critically on this dependent structure. And quantification of uncertainty is one of the main tasks of statistics. And that second order dependent structure is characterized by the auto covariance function, which gives us a correlation between two observations that are k time intervals apart. So uh, the further those two measurements are apart, the, the smaller this, this auto covariance. And it can be alternatively characterized by the spectral density, which is the Fourier transform that basically gives us the intensity or the um, power of the sinusoidal basis function uh, that fluctuate or at a specific frequency. So uh, the spectral density basically decomposes the total variability into uh, the variability uh, uh, for each frequency of these sinusoidal basis functions. So what LIGO assumes in terms of the residual noise is that stationary, it is a Gaussian distributed noise, and it has a certain spectral density that characterizes the instrumental noise of, uh, of the LIGO interferometers. Under these assumptions, and if we assume we know all the parameters that characterize that binary system, what we can do is we can get the probability of observing that particular signal. We can get the so-called forward model, the probability of observing that those data given the unknown parameters. But that's not really what we want. We want to know something about the unknown parameters that characterize the signal given our observations, the so-called inverse probability. And to calculate that inverse probability, we have a formula which is called the Bayes formula. And that starts with a prior distribution of our unknown parameters, which basically comprises everything we know about the parameters before looking at the data, before observing uh, the gravitational wave uh, signal at, at the detector. And then we combine this with our forward model, so-called likelihood, to get the posterior distribution, the inverse probability that we're interested in, which characterizes now, everything we learned about theta from the data, it, it quantifies all the uncertainty after observing the data, the so-called posterior distribution. And that's called Bayes formula after Presbyterian Reverend uh, Bayes, who lived in the 18th century and was credited with being the first one who've come up with this 
approach to statistical inference, to uh, learning about unknown parameters. And it's a bit like a magic formula because it gives us something about an unknown that we care about, the parameters of the gravitational waves, <coughs> given something that we know, the, the observed data. Under the Gaussian stationary assumption, the likelihood function that we need in order to evaluate the posterior distribution has this, this form, and it depends on this covariance matrix, which characterizes the second order dependent structure. And that covariance matrix is high dimensional. One second of LIGO data gives us 16,000 observations. So this is a 16,000 dimensional covariance matrix for which we need the inverse in order to evaluate the likelihood function. That's not really tractable. So to make this tractable, we decompose that signal into its sinusoidal components. In other words, we do a fast Fourier transform, which has the big advantage that once we've expressed the signal in the frequency domain in terms of the so-called Fourier coefficients that gives, give uh, the power of each of the, um, the uh, sinusoidal basis functions, those Fourier coefficients are asymptotically independent. So we no longer have a cor correlation bet between our observations. We no longer need to invert the covariance matrix. So this independence in the frequency ma domain makes this likelihood function tractable. And that is so-called Whittle likelihood approximation that depends on that spectral density S, S of F, and the unknown waveform parameters theta. So the analysis is usually done in the frequency domain. This is called the Whittle likelihood after New Zealand-born statistician uh, Peter Whittle, who made huge contributions to the uh, two time series analysis. So now that we've got a uh, tractable likelihood function, we can put prior distribution on our unknown parameters. LIGO used uh, prior on the masses between once and 80 solar masses, uniform uniform masses for the angles, uh, uniform price for the angles in isotropic uh, price for the, the location, the orientation, and spin vectors. So we can update the prior distribution through the width likelihood to the posterior distribution. The difficulty, though, is that this now is a distribution in a 15-dimensional parameter space. And if we wanted to extract the posterior distribution of just one of those 15 parameters out of, of that High dimensional space, we would need to integrate out over the other ones. So we would need to solve a 14 dimensional integration problem. And that again is difficult with numerical integration. Of course, the LIGO scientists did not start in 2015 to think about that. Way back already in 1992, they advocated, or some of the astrophysicists advocated for using a Bayesian approach. The dominant approach at that time was. Uh, the maximum likelihood approach, or what the physicist would call a Fisher, the Fisher analysis. And for instance, Tom Laredo said it would be really good to use a Bayesian approach, not just because we can use uh, physics information about the, the parameters, prior information, but because of the uncertainty or because of the marginalization of remaining uncertainty about the other parameters that can be used uh, when we're using a Bayesian approach. Uh, the marginalization was seen as the main um, uh, as the main advantage, really. But of course, that marginalization was difficult because of this high dimensional integration problem. But luckily, just parallel to that construction of LIGO in the 1990s, started in 1992 uh, up till 2002, Bayesian inference was revolutionized by the in, uh, advent of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, computer intensive simulation techniques that could deal with this high dimensional integration problem by using computer intensive simulation methods, by simulating from that posterior distribution. And those of you who've done that, that winter school have learned about very advanced Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. In the 1990s, though, the physicist, even though one of the main algorithms underlying Markov chain Monte Carlo, the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, was uh, invented by Metropolis by physicists in the 1950s already. They were not aware of Markov chain Monte Carlo. And I happened 
just by chance at a social function at the University of Oakland that I was talking to my physics colleague, Nelson Christensen. He was talking about his uh, uh, research on stochastic gravitational wave background that he'd done under the supervision uh, of Rainer Weiss at MIT. And he said, we've got these high dimensional integration problems. I was telling him about using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, uh, which I've, I've uh, used for fishery stock assessment using hierarchical Bayesian approaches, state space approaches. And we basically put two and two together and uh, worked on using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods for estimating the parameters. And we started with some very simple lower order post-Newtonian order approximations of the waveforms and showed in a paper in 1998 that it is possible to use NCNC techniques. And that really was embraced by the LIGO scientific community. And over the years, we uh, developed and used advanced Markov chain Monte Carlo methods that were uh, being developed uh, at that time and applied those to uh, gravitational waves and more or less all sorts of advanced techniques have been since then uh, used to estimate gravitational waves. And the two algorithms that are implemented now in the uh, LIGO inference library, LAL, uh, LAL inference, are parallel tempering as well as nested sampling. And with these algorithms, these are now routinely used whenever LIGO detects a gravitational wave to estimate its parameters. With these methods, it is possible to obtain those parameter estimates. For instance, for the black hole masses, uh, it was estimated that uh, for the first black hole merger, that the masses were 36 and 29 times uh, as massive as our sun at a distance, for instance, at 410 megaparsecs. And with two LIGO detectors, we can also get, get uh, an estimate of the signal guy location, which is important for the electromagnetic follow up, as we've seen with the neutron star merger. And if we, once we have the parameter estimates, the 15 parameters that describe a, a, a binary in spiral signal, then we can reconstruct the signal and we see that it gives a good match to the observed data. Current research efforts in uh, LIGO now are focused on characterizing the population of binary in spirals, predicting merger rates, developing fast uh, and accurate um, methods for calculating the evidence or the marginal likelihood to test to enable tests of general relativity. These are often based on thermal, thermodynamic integration or, or path sampling. Uh, <clears throat> Non-parametric estimates to, uh, uh, for the spectral density of the noise. And as we've seen, especially for neutron star mergers, a fast estimate of the sky location is important for an electromagnetic follow-up. Uh, and I often think that the 1990s and the early 2000s, they were the era of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And now I think we're entering a new era of machine learning. And this, uh, I think, will be very important in the future. A lot of research efforts is going now into training uh, neural networks using deep learning so that uh, the effort is, is, can be spent beforehand, but once a, a signal is detected, a parameter estimate can be obtained almost instantaneously. These are still in their infancies and still need to be further developed, but they can also be used for glitch identification, glitches or sort of outliers, large power surges, which are often confused with real signals. And machine learning methods for glitch identification are also combined with citizen science. And I'd like to point you to the Gravitational Wave Open Science Center. LIGO has made all the observed data freely available and has also put software and tutorials uh, onto the website to um, teach how to, how to use the data. And uh, um, so, especially uh, those who've uh, taken part in the winter school and learned about advanced NCNC methods, I encourage you to, to go ahead and try these methods on the real LIGO, real LIGO data. Now, from LIGO to LISA, uh, the ground-based detectors on Earth like LIGO and Virgo and uh, GEO 600, they are limited by their short four-kilometer-long arm lengths 
but also by environmental noise. Uh, there's uh, traffic noise at the low 10 hertz frequency range. There's noise from the ocean waves and the clouds at the millihertz range, the lunar tidal forces, as well as the weather in the microhertz range. So the obvious solution to avoid these uh, low frequency noises to put the interferometer in space. And that's the plan of the space mission called LISA, which is led by the European Space Agency with support from NASA. The launch is to be ex planned as planned for 2034. And the plan is to put an interferometer in each of three spacecraft, which are then flown in a triangular configuration in an orbit around the sun trailing the Earth. And LISA will have 2.5 million kilometer long arms and will be in a quiet space without any environmental noise. So LISA will be operating in a much lower frequency range. LIGO was operating between 20 hertz and 2 kilohertz. LISA will be uh, observing uh, waves of much longer periods, such as extreme mass ratio and spirals, or the supermassive black hole mergers, or the stochastic gravitational wave background from the Big Bang. And in 2017, a Pathfinder mission was flown to check whether it was actually possible to keep the test masses in absolute free fall in space. And that sounds a bit like science fiction. Uh, it is, uh, these test masses have to be, uh, have to have low magnetic susceptibility. So they are uh, made out of a gold platinum alloy and uh, about two, two kilograms uh, encased in Faraday cages and they, should be an absolute free fall. No um, forces other than gravity um, on, the, on those test masses. So to uh, detect any movements of these test masses, they are um, connected with a laser, and this laser continuously monitors their movement. So instead of making those test masses follow the movement of the spacecraft, it's the spacecraft that follows any movement of the test masses. And for that, there's microthrusters on board that give off little puffs that direct the spacecraft around the test tubes whenever there's a movement detected. And the Pathfinder mission was flown and ended in December 2017. And it exceeded the expectations and the LISA space mission was given the go ahead. So a lot of technological challenges have to be overcome before the launch. Uh, uh, theoretical astrophysicists are working on accurate waveform models. Uh, data scientists are working on uh, uh, realistic signal simulators and uh, noise simulators for the LISA mission to simulate realistic LISA data, uh, which can be used to tune algorithms for estimating the parameters of the signals that LISA is going to observe. And there's an awful lot of further challenges that Lisa is going to provide, which I think will keep the statisticians and data scientists quite, quite busy over the next uh, 10 years or so until Lisa is going to be launched. So with this, I, I think I, I'd like to finish and point you to a website of our New Zealand uh, Gravity Group. We are part of the International Lisa Consortium comprising of uh, astrophysicists and data scientists from various different New Zealand universities. Just let me finish with Galileo again. Uh, it's 400 years now that Galileo first pointed his telescope to the night sky and observed the moons of Jupiter. And just uh, think about all those uh, insights that the astrophysicists have gained from electromagnetic telescopes. And it's been six years that LIGO uh, first was switched on and observed gravitational waves uh, from black hole mergers. So one can only speculate uh, what insights uh, the combination of gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves in this new era of multi-messenger astronomy is going to bring. I'd like to also acknowledge cont contributions for my collaborators from LISA and LIGO, as well as PhD students and postdocs who've worked on various different aspects um, and point you to a few papers, references, uh, in particular uh, review papers that give uh, an overview of parameter estimation methods for gravitational waves, uh, if you're interested. 
So thank you very much for, for your interest and I'm very happy to take any questions uh, that you might, might have. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Professor. I, I first want to just say thank you from both the MC Winter School and the, and the SSA. Um, at this time, we'd like to go ahead and open up the floor for questions. Please, if you're, you're viewing remotely, go ahead and ask your questions in the Q&A function in Zoom, and I will go ahead and read them out. To... So I think there was already one question. Uh, it's marked as answered, but if the user wanted to go ahead and ask it again, or I can unmute them and they can ask themselves. While they're typing, perhaps I'll go ahead and start off the Q&A with, with a question myself. Um, so I, I, I'm a little unclear about how exactly LIGO is estimating the parameters of these mergers in a sense. So you have different types of mergers, right? Are they yeah. viewing all of the data of these mergers as one data set or is it broken down to different classes? Because I would guess the parameters would change as the different types of mergers changed. Oh, yes. No, they, uh, LIGO is, is observing one signal at a time. And uh, at, at, uh, in the last observing run, they were observing about one signal per week. Uh, so now each, each signal is uh, treated as an individual signal and estimated uh, individually. But now that we have observed 50 uh, binary and spirals already, the physicists can uh, use what they call population synthesis models where they uh, treat, uh, where, where they try to estimate the parameters, the population parameters as well by putting hyperpriors on those parameters. And that gets, gets us to hierarchical models where then we are combining all this, or, or we're treating all the signals individually, but uh, each, for instance, each of the black hole mergers is regarded as one realization from a population of black hole mergers. And now we can already say something about the population parameters. So that... And they search for different hyperparameter specifications as well, yeah. if I recall correctly, right? Yes, that's, that's right. And uh, I mean, each, uh, if you know about MCMC, they usually take an awful long time to run and they Accurate parameter estimates take, can take days to weeks to run with a lull inference just for one signal. And uh, I mean, this is, is a big computational challenge, but with parallel computing and, and uh, high performance uh, computers, that, that is now possible. And especially Osgraph in uh, Australia has made huge contributions to the analysis of gravitational waves. Awesome, thank you, that was, that was a great answer. I'll go ahead and read out the, the first question from the Q&A, which was asking about the, the 15 dimensional space, for instance, in the, in the gravitational wave problem. Um, mm -hmm. What were they using before and how was that difficult in terms of the techniques they were using versus what you would do at MCMC? I know sampling mm -hmm. at MCMC using 15 dimensions is pretty easy, it's just time consuming. It's time, yeah. Uh, before they were using uh, maximum likelihood estimates, but of course they require taking derivatives of quite um, complicated waveforms. If you use uh, low order post-Newtonian approximations, you can still write them down analytically, but they, they are com com complicated forms. And, and just by taking the derivatives, first and second order derivatives, that, that's quite, quite difficult if you want to estimate or quantify your uncertainty about the um, get, getting a Fisher information matrix, basically. Um, but higher order, post to, oh, the, the more complicated or, or more accurate waveform models, they're basically computer models. They, they are uh, generated by, by, by computers. So um, you m might still be able to do this successfully using um, uh, uh, tensor flow or something. Yeah, to, yeah, it, 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 it might be, be possible, but then you, you're still rely, relying on large sample asymptotics. And yeah. so I think MCMC techniques, uh, plus, as I, I said, uh, it's also the 
marginalization over the uncertainty of all the other parameters that is a big advantage of, of Bayesian inference. Uh, whereas if you're using maximum likelihood techniques, you are usually fixing uh, parameters, these nuisance parameters, which you are not terribly interested in, but they influence your, your problem. You're fixing them at certain estimates rather than marginal integrating over all possible possible values of those and you, you get a more accurate estimate of the uncertainty. Mm, awesome. Thank you very much for that, that question. It was, uh, it was great. Hey, David, we, we have a question here from the Brisbane Hub. Go ahead, mate. Hi, Renate. Um, Joshua Bond here. Thank you for Hi. an absolutely fantastic talk. Um, just a stellar public lecture. Um, you. you reminded me that uh, Laplace was actually using Bayes' theorem to study the night sky in the 18th and 19th century um, that I heard uh, quite recently, actually. So that was just a beautiful thing to um, link in. My question is, with estimating the parameters of the, um, I guess, forward model, but also estimating the noise, the background noise that you observe, what kind of time, like observation length, do you need for that? And is it the same? It the same um, that's a very good question. Uh, for the stochastic gravitational wave background, we have much longer uh, time periods. We need, need longer observation uh, periods. And um, especially uh, for uh, Lisa, um, I think this is one of the huge challenges that, that is still uh, outstanding. Uh, with, once Lisa is up in space uh, and switched on, it will be bombarded from all directions with, with gravitational waves. So a big problem is to resolve individual signals, which could, uh, will usually, will be, can have sh or usually have lo longer wavelengths. And, uh, but at the same time, also estimating the stochastic gravitational wave background. Um, does, does it sort of un answer your, your question? I yeah, don't, I don't I think this has, hasn't been um, uh, resolved so far. And LIGO has, so far has, no, has not detected any stochastic gravitational wave background. Uh, the, I think the sensitivity so far was, was too low. Uh, but they, from from all the uh, measurements we we have so far, uh, we can at least um, estimate upper bounds for the stochastic gravitational wave background. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. I'll go ahead and read out a few more questions we're getting in the chat. Uh, so Quang asks, how are the mirrors on the ends of each detector kept so still? It's seriously bewildering that it's possible to measure a ten to the minus eighteen distortion at over four kilometers. Uh, I, I, I don't, I would have to refer this uh, to uh, one of the physicists, so I, I don't really know how, how they keep the mirror so still, but the, the whole LIGO uh, technology is just absolutely um, mind-boggling, I think. It, it is a, a huge feat of the en engineers that uh, they were able to, to measure these tiny displacements. It is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, the, mm -hmm. so I'll go ahead and say the last question before there's another speaker at the, at the QUT hub. So, yeah. the, so Anthony says, are there statistics theory spin-offs from the challenges posed the analysis, from the analysis of the LIGO data, similar to tech spin-offs that you get in biz, big physics projects? Are there statistics spin-offs? Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess they're kind of asking what, what yeah. theoretical problems are in the LIGO and LISA data sets that are kind of currently ah, being worked on. It is, uh, a wonderful question, <laughs> a great question. Uh, yeah, I think an awful lot of uh, spin-offs. Uh, uh, our group, for instance, has focused over the last few years on um, Bayesian non-parametric spectral density estimation. So Bayesian non-parametric methods were uh, sort of developed over the last 10 years. A lot of uh, research efforts has gone into them. But a lot of them were considering the traditional IID assumption, or at least independence, but with 
time series data, we don't, we don't have this independence. And uh, we've looked at Bayesian non-parametric methods to um, estimate the spectral density of time series because LIGO so far were, was assuming the spectral density to be known and fixed, but of course the noise, instrumental noise is not known and it, it is also not really fixed because uh, the stationarity assumption is sort of um, a bit problematic as well. So all of this triggered theoretical research into Bayesian non-parametric methods and we've recently got, got uh, looked at, at proving posterior consistency. Which for those who saw your lecture at SSA, you talked quite a bit about, which I was a big fan of, because as those who have taken the, the winter school with me now, I'm a big fan of posterior consistency. So I think you guys have a question in the QUT hub, Chris. Uh, hi, thanks, David. Uh, thank you, Renate, again, for a magnificent talk. Um, some, a, an answer that you gave to Joshua Bond's, um, oh, sorry, that I introduced myself. I'm Lawrence Davies from the uh, QUT hub. Um, an answer you gave to Joshua Bond's talk on, um, on uh, time series length, uh, you mentioned something about um, the stationarity of the background noise. Um, that rang a bell from a, a former brief career in seismology in that uh, background noise often yields characteristics about um, a structure that uh, you can make inference on as well. Is there work being done in, uh, it, it, if you could uh, make an analog for, I guess, events such as uh, mergers as uh, earthquakes, for instance, then background noise would be everything else that's happening in between. Is there mm -hmm. inference being done on that particular, on that yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's where the Bayesian non-parametric methods have be, have been used and developed to um, characterize the the instrumental noise. And uh, uh, the the dominant approach is using um, uh, um, a, a spline approx approximation, basically uh, using mix mixtures of B, B splines, cubic cubic splines, really. To, uh, to model the, the instrumental noise. And it's quite, yeah, as far as, as parameter estimation is concerned, it is important to estimate uh, the instrumental noise simultaneously as well with, with the signals. But with LIGO, we have separate stretches of data where there is no signal, where we can safely assume that it's just noise and we can uh, estimate noise characteristics uh, from from those noise stretches, but LIGO is also LIGO noise is also well known to be sli slowly time varying. It is not it's stationary for time periods of a second or two or three, but for for longer time periods, it is slowly slowly moving. It changes its characteristics, and um, methods for non-stationary time series or locally stationary time series are, are quite important uh, for LIGO as well. And uh, just to follow up, is this uh, just for in instrument noise uh, inference or is this also for other, I guess, uh, structural characteristics of- Also, yeah, the it, they use Bayesian non-parametric methods as well for um, uh, estimating the gravitational waveform from in spirals without assuming any parametric waveform model that has phys a physical interpretation. You can also model that uh, chirp signal using uh, just a mixture of, of, of splines or a mixture of wavelets. And uh, these types of models are, are you, uh, have been used as well, in, in particular for signal reconstruction, but they haven't got any physical interpretation, the parameters of those are coefficients of wavelets, but they don't really make any sense. You can't really tell how, how big, how massive were, were these objects or how, uh, where, where were they in the sky or anything like that. Does that answer, answer your question? Um, it answers a different question. Um, I was right. more of a to uh, tomography kind of sense. Uh, right, right. If that, uh, if that make, uh, rings a bell, if that's a, um, a structure that uh, you, can, you can tell without uh, events um, such as um, mergers or things like that, 
if that if that noise is uh, um, uh, reminiscent of past events, I think you had a chart of uh, the Big Bang uh, spanning a, a very large um, uh, bandwidth. Yeah. Um, and uh, if that gives you that, uh, if if that uh, in between noise gives you that kind of information. Um. Yeah, for, for this, uh, hmm. not, not quite sure, for the stochastic gravitational wave background with LIGO, uh, they use cross-correlation methods because they have got two detectors and with a cross-correlation you can es actually estimate the stochastic gravitational wave background because the instrumental noise would basically disappear. Um, I think that answers yeah. my question, yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Awesome. So we have at least one more question in the chat I'm going to ask, which is that, so Lewis asks, in your opinion, is Fisher, infer is Fisher matrix forecasts, are they important in gravitational wave astronomy? Um, don't, don't know what he means by Fisher matrix forecasts. Maybe you do? <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure about forecasts, but uh, the Fisher matrices were, are used for uh, quantifying the standard errors. Of, of the estimates. And um, I mean, we, we, the large sample asymptotics that they rely on are probably no big deal because we have an awful lot of, in, of samples uh, with gravitational wave data. Uh, I think just the, it, they're just difficult to, to calculate, but they can be, uh, I mean, in, in, in a lot of uh, applications, uh, they quite often give good, uh, proposal proposals for for MCMC for Metropolis Hastings algorithms and uh, yeah I think they they definitely have their their value um, and uh, uh, qu quite often um, the classical maximum likelihood estimate in the MCMC will give similar results uh, as well so if they can can be applied, yes, I think they, they have have their value. Awesome. But, uh, the the problem is not really forecasting uh, in gravitational waves. It's. I it's think he may have met Fisher information matrix. Is my is my yeah. guess. Yeah. So I I will follow up with that question actually, which is that we know Bayes methods and frequentist methods give similar results in classical settings when the model is correctly specified. But when the models are misspecified, they can give vastly different results. For instance, the QMLE is kind of an inbuilt robustness to misspecification versus Bayes tend to under or overcover randomly, depending on the correct, the actual value of the Fisher information matrix. Mm -hmm. Are there, are physicists interested in these type of questions or are they so certain in their models that they just believe them with absolute certainty? Uh. No, I think they, they are interested and uh, I think they, they usually uh, uh, they, they, they know that, that the assumptions they make on, on their models are uh, approximate assumptions and they query the um, uh, whether these assumptions are realistic and, and uh, model checking uh, is extremely important and has been extremely important. They want to avoid any sort of uh, criticism as, as well. So I think they, they treat model checking and uh, checking their assumptions very, very seriously. But I, th I think that that's also an area where a lot of uh, effort could, could be suspended, where, where statisticians could still make quite a bit of a, uh, a ro in the inroad when um, y using sort of sophisticated methods for, for model, model checking. And I also think that Bayesian non-parametric methods would yeah, ha have, have their importance uh, because yeah, they, they don't make these strong parametric assumptions. But they are also very usually quite slow to to converge and uh, yeah. Are there any other questions from the from the crowd? 
Awesome. I just want to go ahead and thank uh, Professor Renata again, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to Chris. Thank you very much for, for having me. All right. Thanks very much, David. And uh, thanks very much, Renata, for a brilliant presentation. Um, everyone in the audience here was really enthralled and um, yeah, it was just really great stuff to see, you know, Bayes coming to, coming to the rescue for these kind of problems. Um, certainly Bayesian uh, inference has been a really key uh, theme in, in the winter school. So it's really nice to see a, a great connection there. Um, so thanks very much everyone again. Um, thanks to AMSI, thanks to the Stats Society of Australia. Thank you so much, David, for, for um, representing the SSA uh, for this event. And thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.